Okay, well, I think we'll get started. Hopefully everyone can hear me and you can also see my screen. <laughs> uh, if not, please shout out or put something in the chat. So I'm just going to begin by giving a little opening statement um, before handing over to the speakers. So hopefully I can change my screen and it will work. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I wanted just to go through the what, the why and the how. So what are soft skills? Um, I'm sure you're all aware, that's why you're joining this event, but basically they're kind of the general attributes that aren't specific to any industry or job role. Um, they're usually self-developed and they can be transferred across any profession. And obviously we also use them every day in our private lives as well. So um, just to highlight some examples of soft skills that are relevant to architects. Uh, I wanted to start by mentioning emotional intelligence, which might be a phrase you've already heard of before. Um, it's quite a broad topic um, and you could probably argue that most of the soft skills could kind of be housed under the emotional intelligence headline. Um, but basically it's the ability to manage your emotions and to get the best relationships with your teams and your clients and your consultants. Um, as you may or may not know yet, projects never really run smoothly. There's always some hiccup because there's so many different external factors involved in them um, and that, that, that really are out of our control. So it's how you deal with those that can really make a difference. So your emotional intelligence can be really helpful to either make or break um, how enjoyable your working environment is. Communication. Now again, these are all quite obvious things, but communication is key to the success of a project. Um, as an architect, we need to describe our design and detailing information to the team or the client and understand the important details that are being communicated back to us, such as surveys or programming or sequencing issues that may affect the project. The way we communicate with communities as well that the projects will affect or be within is also very important and crucial in gaining planning permission, but I'm sure Joe will expand on this further later. Uh, communication is essential within the office too, uh, as you'll likely be working in teams to develop this, the design. Problem solving, um, again, straightforward. It, it is what it, it says it is. As architects, we are hired to solve problems um, and find solutions for people, be that on domestic level with resolving issues with family houses and how they can work best to suit that family or a, a bigger sort of developer uh, who has a lot of a plot of land that they are not sure what to do with. So it involves us understanding situations and making calculated decisions. Negotiation is another key skill um, either for negotiating or discussing fees or our scope of work. Uh, specific deliverables we need to carry out or the time frames we need to carry them out in. Um, so it's how you strike that balance between uh, a realistic and reasonable uh, response. Uh, time management, um, I think this is something that everyone um, kind of has to get used to. Um, efficiency and accuracy are obviously key, um, but how do you how do you manage that? So prioritising activities and delivering them when promised is obviously what we have to do as professionals. Um, it's not about pulling all nighters. I'm not sure if you have experienced that in your in your uni lives. Um, it should never happen at uni and it should certainly never happen in the office environment. Um, and leadership. So either as a lead consultant, which architects are often asked to be on projects, or as a project architect who manage a team within their office. Um, Obviously, some people are born leaders and others develop the skills as they go along. So basically, this accounts for about 50 percent. Soft skills account for about 50 percent of your working day and even more as you go up the ladder um, managerial ladder. So as a director, it could be about 80 percent of your day that involves soft skills. So why is it important? Um, I think a point that I hope Ryan will touch on is that the architectural education can often miss the collaboration team working elements of projects as assignments are mostly directed at individuals. So working in isolation on design briefs that are formed by themselves, which obviously doesn't affect the um, reflect the working environment. 
Um, so I think once you come out of um, your part one and part two and you have to look uh, for work in an office, then that's when your soft skills suddenly become crucial. So uh, recruitment, I just wanted to mention quickly that um, obviously you need to use your soft skills as part of the um, recruitment. And for us at David Miller Architects, collaboration is kind of a core part of our mission statement. So it's the key to success and enjoyment and the satisfaction of our jobs. So when recruiting people, we look for personal skills and attitude over technical knowledge because we feel that technical knowledge can be taught. So for us, it's not about the person that shouts the loudest. It's more about the person that comes with a more considered and considerate approach. Job role. Um, the point here is that we have to work with so many different disciplines, about seven or eight, even just on a small project, we've got your client, structural engineer, mechanical and electrical engineer, planners, building control, contractor, subcontractors. And within those organisations, there might be a few people working on each project. On the larger projects, you could easily have about 20 different bodies you're working with. So hopefully you can see the scale of those projects uh, means that communication is really key because each person who works on the project will bring with them their own take and experiences that lay on top of what you're trying to say and communicate, which can mean that the message gets slightly changed and that's where the issues can arise. It's also really important nowadays in the virtual world as we're all virtually having this discussion today, um, everything is online post the pandemic and it's quite hard to build relationships virtually. It's hard to see body language and social cues are often missed. So I think um, meetings are as well, most people kind of try to get to the point of the meeting now because you'll have four or five lined up in a row. So there's no small talk around the meetings, which means you don't get to know the person as well. Also, it's very easy just to type messages on Teams rather than picking up the phone that can kind of cause further isolation. Uh, and mean you're losing those vital soft skills. So how can we improve and focus on our soft skills? I'm sure the talks today will help in this regard, but a few notes from me would be being a part of a nurturing office culture, looking for good role models, um, you could try formal training that's available, such as leadership training, or um, asking for feedback is a great way, and adhering to a schedule. So planning out your day uh, by setting out realistic goals and sticking to them is really important. So hopefully this gives you a little overview of some important soft skills for architects. But with timings in mind, I shall um, pass you on to our first speaker, uh, Juliet Mitchell from Archetypal. So a little introduction. Hi, Juliet. <laughs> Hi, um, Anna. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I can I can just give a little introduction yeah. to Juliet, um, if that's OK. Uh, but so your background, quite interestingly, is not in architecture and um, as an editor for Penguin Books. Yep. So um, I believe that you came to architecture after having um, your own house renovation and yep. it kind of piqued yep. your interest, which yep. is a, a direct opposite well, from what my house extension is uh, doing to me at the moment. <laughs> Um, but I think it's really interesting because architects are very visual and portray that idea and concepts through sketches and diagrams rather than words. So hopefully through your talk, you can explain how important words can be, especially in a world where we have to do a lot of written competitions, written tenders or even written CVs to get the job a job in the first place. So I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So. Um, well, it's very good to be here and to, uh, well, I can't actually see you all, but I'm imagining you all out there and listening to me. And um, I want to start by saying that when I first started working with architects, um, I couldn't believe how they all sounded almost the same. So I knew they must be different. I knew this was all, these were all humans behind these practices, but a lot of the practices sounded very, very similar. And I'm wondering whether you, as students, young architects, people going into the pr profession, whether you've also found that you, you're finding it difficult to work out kind of who you know what what are the different thing how each practice is different and what really makes them stand out and what do they stand for and 
you know, have you found as well that when you go to a website, that's not quite coming across? So that was definitely my feeling when I started working with architects, which was about five years ago. Um, and for all th those five years of uh, running Archetypal and working with architects, my main mission has been to help architects find their voice and get their story straight. It's been very much about writing because writing is my background. Uh, you know, I worked with writers who, uh, you know, had to earn their living through words. But now I was working with people who don't uh, earn a living from their words. They earn a living from from architecture, from drawing, from a very visual, uh, visual and technical profession. But I felt that actually for, for everyone and for, for architects, it's really important to know how to speak, how to communicate and to make sure that that comes across. So those have been my last five years and I'm hoping that my next five years will be very much the same. Again, helping architects really reach the people that they're trying to talk to. So thinking about um, the fact that uh, a lot of architects sound very much the same, um, uh, obviously, that's relevant to you because you want to find the right people to work for. And I think you want to kind of really try and get across what it is about the, that uh, that practice that is different. I want you to um, to get a bit of psychology straight so that you can work out why this is important. So what architects are doing when they're uh, talking about themselves, often they're starting from a point of ego. They're saying we've done this. Uh, you know, we've got all these fantastic projects, we've got all this experience, that's who we are. But I don't want you to do that. I want you, when you're going out there into the world, uh, approaching architecture, uh, architects and um, practices that you want to work for, I want you to go out there with uh, a starting point of empathy. And the reason that that's important is that we are all, um, when we come to a website, or when we come, when we start speaking to someone or when we pick up a book and start wondering, oh, do we want to read this? We're really thinking, what's in it for me? We are our own reference point for kind of interacting with the world. And that's not really surprising because there's so much out there. There are so many possibilities that we have to have a starting point. And that starting point is us. And when you put together a CV or you're doing a crit or you're writing an application, I want you to remember that that's how someone is coming to your application or to your CV. They are thinking, what's in it for me? Which might sound a bit self-centered, but that's just the way we are as humans. So when you are writing about yourself, you need to think about the other person's point of view. Now, this was a part of Anna's slides, actually, and what Anna said, which was really interesting, is put them, put yourselves in their shoes. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to put yourself in, say, your employer's shoes. And they're thinking, what is this? How is this person going to help me? So they're not thinking about you for your own, just, just like that, you. They're thinking, how can this person help me? And if you can remember that if you're interested in them, and how you can help them, they will then be interested in you. So basically, empathy is coming out of ourselves, putting ourselves in their shoes and seeing how we can help them. And that's how we get a great response from someone. So it's about taking on board their psychology to make sure the way that we communicate works. Now, just to sort of make that a little bit, little bit more concrete, I'm going to share my screen. This is a photo of um, the uh, WIIA event, which is Women in Architecture. And um, it was uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, this is a, uh, I was there. Now, when I got that photo, which I think came up on Instagram or LinkedIn or something, I, uh, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, which is what was the first thing or person that I looked for when I saw that photo? And I want to ask you, when you see a group photo that you know you're in, what is the first thing that you look for? And of course, the answer is yourself. And that just shows how we are the first. We are our starting point. We are our own reference point for the world. Um, so there I am. I'm sort of at the back there, halfway up the stairs. Um, so that is just to sort of bring home to you uh, how we are all our own starting point. And therefore, when you come to an employer, think about, you know, that's where they're starting from. 
they're starting from themselves and then thinking, how can you help them and them? That's the important bit. So um, I uh, talked earlier about how all architects sound the same, and I'm now going to show another slide. Uh, this is a, uh, an practice profile that I put together, but I put it together from all sorts of things that other that real architects say and that really do not come across the, you know, there's no humanity in this. So it's, you know, founded in 1996, Dell Architects is an award-winning practice, a multidisciplinary architectural practice with a wide-ranging, um, uh, uh, wide-ranging services. You get the gist. That's all you need to know, that this is never going to make anyone feel, oh, I, I feel like these are the architects I want to work with. So I wanted to show you this just so that you understand what I'm talking about when I say starting from a point of ego or starting from a point of empathy. This is starting from a point of ego. It's all about what they've done. They're not reaching out to their clients. They're not making eye contact with their clients or figurative eye contact. Um, and when you go out there into the world, I want you to be the opposite. I want you to start with empathy. Put yourself in your employer's or possible employer's shoes and think about how you can help them. And if you can think about that and be interested in them, they will then be interested in you. So talking about that, I thought we'd get quite specific and have a look or think about um, if you're writing an email to a uh, potential employer. So again, uh, unfortunately, I don't think the whole thing is showing, but uh, I think I can remember what's on the rest of the slide. So this is an email to a practice you'd love to join. And the what I uh, when I uh, think about an email and this wouldn't this could be for lots of different kinds of emails, especially difficult emails that we're finding difficult to write. Think of it as a you sandwich. Now, by you, I'm thinking about the person that you're talking to. So rather than just say, I want to work with you and this is what uh, this is who I am and hope for the best. I want you to start in your email by talking about them. Tell them why you're writing to them. Why have you chosen them? You know, what's special about them that makes you want to work with them? If you can be interested in them, they are then ready to be interested in you, which is then step two. So step two, you then follow up with how you can help. What it is it? What is it about you that chimes or, you know, that means that they chime with you, that you want to work with them? So from talking about them, you've got their interest, then you can talk about you. And then step three, you can then bring it together. And, you know, uh, the bit that you can't read here is what next? Suggest a conversation. So suggest to them, uh, you know, how you can bring it together, that you'd love to meet them and tell them about yourself and find out more about them. But something in that step three that brings the two of you together, them and you. And if you can do that, if you can have those three stages, you are in tune with sort of human psychology you're going to pique their interest. You know, you've been interested in them. That means that they're then interested in you. And then you're bringing the two of you together. And in a way, it's a little story, you know, from talking about them to how you can help them to then bringing the two together and talking about uh, how you could work with them. So uh, I've mentioned then their stories and um, stories are great. I'm um, a great fan of stories and how they help us make sense of the world, how they make things meaningful, how they um, make us care and how they tap into our emotions and also how they make it easier for us when we're writing something. It means that we've got a structure in place and, you know, we take our audience with us. Um, and before I go into a bit more detail about stories, I'm just going to read you something which is by Martin Evans, who is a, an, I'll call him an enlightened developer. He's a, he writes for the um, publication BD and he, um, like me, he's a great fan of stories. So, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely with him on that. And I'm just going to read to you a little piece he wrote in one of his um, columns in BD. Um, and you can think of this as just having a story read to you. So enjoy it. It's not too long. So only um, uh, about 30 seconds or so. So at the beginning of December, I spent a morning doing crits with MA students at the Bartlett. It was my second visit to hear presentations from first term students, all new to London. They presented the results of research projects into three areas of the city, undergoing enormous chains, Shoreditch, Clerkenwell and Soho. 
What they were practicing was the ability to understand a place, uncover its history, dissect its present and show a glimpse of its future. What they were doing was learning how to tell a story. What I hoped as I listened to them talk was that as they worked their way into jobs in practices and around the, around the world, where the luxuries of time and resource are often limited, their enthusiasm for story storytelling wouldn't be dulled. So that's Martin Evans talking about the importance of storytelling when you're a student and when you're having to sort of uh, talk about place and and get into the stories of, of um, uh, you know, of place and of buildings, but how important it is in practice as well to be able to tell those stories and to take your audience with you. Um, so, um, Bethan, are you happy to move to the next slide for me? Right. So a project story. So um, uh, architects have a terrible um, way of talking about project descriptions instead of project stories. But I am um, uh, I'm very anti project descriptions and very into project stories, because when you write about a project, it's about, um, uh, you know, it, it's about the the narrative behind the project. So the best way of doing that is to think of having three things. And um, a story always has a beginning, middle and end. And I know that sounds obvious, but it's a good thing to remember. And it does make writing easier. Give yourself three signposts, beginning, middle and end for your beginning. Talk about the inspiration behind the project. That's the why of the project. Then your middle is the challenge of the project, the how. And when we talk about the challenge, the challenge is absolutely the a chance to talk about your skills and your knowledge. It's not just say, say oh, this was the problem, but it's then that's the way in to what you bring to a project, how you help. And um, another thing to say about that is that every project story is necessarily curated. You're not going to try and say everything because as soon as you try and say everything, there's too much information and you lose the narrative thread. So curate it, choose a really good challenge that was a substantial, chunky challenge that gave you a chance to uh, show your skills. And that's the challenge that should be at the heart of the story. And I should say that the hero or in this story is going to be the client, the people who, or it could be the end users, the people who are going to use the building. They are at the heart of the story and you as the architect um, or architectural assistant, student is the helper, the enabler in that story. And then finally, the end is impact. So how did, or rather, what was the, um, what was the outcome of this project? How did it change people's lives? Um, what, you know, what was the, what, as I say, what was the impact of the project? Um, and, you know, give yourself that beginning, middle end, inspiration, challenge and impact. And you will find that suddenly stories become much, much easier to tell. And they will you'll keep your readers with you because that's the thing about stories. We all love being told stories and that makes it so much more interesting than just writing a project description. And Bethan, if you're happy to go to my next slide. So um, I'm on that note of, you know, the power of stories. I want you to remember, um, you know, even when you're as, an, as a student or whether you're already in practice, this is really important to remember that images and words do different things. So play to their strengths. So, yes, images inspire, inspire us. They show the design, they set the stage and they make the vision real. We all need images in architecture. You know, I can't imagine uh say an architect's website without images of course we need that but with your words don't try and do the same as the images do you know use the words to to tell a different story and that is um to tell the human story and then the other things i've got here are to build trust because words do that they show how you think so they show the thought processes behind a project. And then, as I've said, they tell a human story that doesn't always come across in the images and they leave space for the imagination. And that is a wonderful thing about words is that they leave us to do a lot of the thinking ourselves and to kind of fill in the blanks um, in, a, in a way that that images don't do so much. So images, you know, making that vision real, that's just as important, but words do something different. So that's the uh, that's uh, kind of everything I want to tell you. And I will just if Beth and if you're happy to go to the last slide. 
Um, I on now on the screen, you should just see my email address and a writing toolkit for architects. And I will just put this up so that you can see it. This is my little writing toolkit for architects. And it, um, I've tried to summarize in this little fold out card some of the really important things about how to how to um, get words down on paper or screen, how to write about your projects, about yourself, about your ideas. If anyone would like one, um, I've got a little stack to send out in the post. So just send me an email at juliettearchetypal with an I dot co dot UK and I'll put one in the post to you. But I'm very happy to um, send them out to you to help you and to make sure that you go out into the world and um, yeah, have those soft skills at the ready, remembering about empathy, about thinking about what your audience is interested in and therefore that's how you start you start with empathy and with being helpful and being interested in them and then they'll be interested in you great so thank you very much everyone I hope that's been um, helpful apologies for the technical glitches but we all have those and um, thank you Bethan for sharing my screen with for me thank you oh thank you very much Juliet um... Those technical issues always get me as well, but I will definitely be writing you an email for the for the toolkit for architects. I'm sure I could I could use that. Thank you. Um, so uh, please do write any questions in the chat. If everyone can find it, it should be like the chats on the top um, icon. So just click on there and write any questions down for Juliet, um, and we'll answer those at the end of the session. Um, but now I would like to introduce uh, Joe Harrop from Placed. Um, Placed is a, well, shout out if I get this wrong, Joe, but it's Northwest Social Enterprise and um, helps people of all ages um, and backgrounds to engage in planning, design through community consultation, engagement and education. Um, and I know you're very passionate about um, diversifying the voices uh, within the built environment, which is excellent. Uh, and enabling people to kind of help to shape their future and the places and spaces that they live and work around. Um, so you're going to talk about the value of engaging with your local communities, um, which I think in our opinion at DMA is, is a really crucial piece of the design process. So without further ado, go for it, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I feel like that was a test for you, Anna. Anna is one of our volunteers, our ambassadors, and so are several of our colleagues, and also one of our sponsors of our education programme. So I feel like that was really putting you on the spot, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, way. actually, I will say this, Joe, that if anyone out there is looking to help um, their soft skills, volunteering for any of these kind of things is a really great way of um, kind of uh, you know, improving your soft skills. So volunteering for place, if you can, would be a great thing to do. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> enough from me. <laughs> I do a equally subtle pitch. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm just going to be talking a little bit about, well, consultation, engagement and education in the design process um, and a, a combination of um, the benefit to architects, the benefits to communities um, of being part of that process um, and really probably just introducing to what engagement might mean and what good engagement might mean as well. So a bit of a, I guess, a whistle stop tour. Um, so in terms of us, so as Anna says, she's covered this perfectly. Um, we're a social enterprise, um, which effectively means not that, that we our profit is, is for good basically so profit that we get from our commercial activities are reinvested for social value and social benefit for the communities that we work with and for us it's really about diversifying the voices involved in the built environment and that's kind of that might for us that's greater representation of the communities in which we are working so there's kind of not a one size fits all within that and um, we fundamentally believe that everyone's an expert about the built environment and um, when you finish university you're going to obviously have a lot of knowledge a lot of skills that you've been developing but those who live in that area a 10 year old is going to have a, a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills to bring to that table as well it's just different experience and different knowledge um our team we're, we're quite small there's only five of us and we are a mixture of design professionals educators my degrees architecture and um, but worked in regeneration so kind of um drawing on lots of different skills that are relevant to the sector and um, we've got about 140 volunteers including Anna and some of her colleagues um, who are ambassadors and they bring an amazing amount of their knowledge and value to everything that we do and really kind of especially within our education programs 
give young people from other communities, different backgrounds, role models that they can relate to. Um, and fundamentally, we do two strands, education and engagement. Um, our education has really kind of taken a, a focus on youth voice and education, so a real crossover between the two. And we've worked with thousands of young people um, over the last 10 years um, and thousands of non-young people too. Why engage? And, and I think this, in terms of those soft skills, engagement is most definitely a soft skill. Um, it's one that sometimes architects can find a bit challenging. I think particularly having gone through the crit process and that almost having to defend your designs and, and explain why you've done things, it's hard to kind of take a step back, not feel personal criticism when someone doesn't necessarily like what you're suggesting, doesn't understand your expertise. Um, so it's definitely a soft skill in thinking about how you listen and how you reflect and how you uh, try not to just give an answer like you would in a crit when you do an engagement. But in terms of why we do engagement, um, fundamentally, we just believe that we can only create places that um, are better, that meet local needs by working with the local community and bring them together with the um, built environment professionals, the experts in that sense. Um, I think we recognise there's real lo lo value in that local knowledge and that first-hand experience. If we're coming into a project and we do a site visit, we can only experience that place for a very short length of time. We don't necessarily know what it's like at night time, at the weekend, in winter, in summer, but the people who live around that space really do. And so it's really drawing on that knowledge, understanding what the problems are, understanding how spaces are used by working with those who live around there. Um, by engaging, we can make sure that we're creating spaces for unique needs and the challenges that communities face. And that could be because of um, the diversity within that community. It could be that we there's a lot of um, people with young children in that area. Therefore, how easy is it for them to get up and down curbs and public spaces? How easy is it for them to access buildings? It could be a lot of old people in the community. How is design supporting them? So really understanding that community makeup and the challenges that they face is really important. Um, and I think by involving and engaging communities from the beginning of a project, we can really help to ensure that places are cared for and that they're sustainable and the community feel proud of them long term. I mean, it's that endless sort of example that if you involve a group of young people in creating a green space, that green space is more likely to be there in 12 months time than if it's just done to a community. Um, what makes good engagement? It's a really interesting sort of um, ongoing conversation. I think when I, um, I first set up placed engagement, a lot of the engagement I was seeing was very tokenistic and it's kind of this is what you're getting. So more consultation. This is the solution. Can we take off the box? I think that's certainly evolved over the last 10 years and is now a lot of tenders that we see in requiring engagement to be undertaken or, or even co-production and co-design. Um, so it's definitely a shift in, and you will see this as you go into practice, there's a more emphasis on ensuring communities are involved. But in terms of the quality of that engagement, there's still a whole realm of opportunities and possibilities. So I think for me, if you're going to go into practice, some of the things you might want to encourage and try and get that practice to do when they're doing engagements is some of these. So be really clear about the purpose of engagement and the parameters. So what change can you make to a design by working with the community? What can't they shape? What's off the table? So that's really about identifying with your skills and your experience and the practice experience in the client. What are the things that actually are fixed? There's no point taking that to the community because that will just create um, a disenfranchised community that don't want to be part of the process. What can they shape? Is that around the materials? Is that around the activity? Is around that feel of the space? What can people shape? Um, early stage, wherever we can, we go into a project really early on. We quite often work within a design team. And so we will get in quite often um, at a brief development stage or very early concept stage. Um, so we have a stage zero onwards, ideally. Um, rather than leaving it to the end when essentially you're showing someone a finished product, a finished design. 
um, being really collaborative with the engagement. So it's about enabling people to hear other people's ideas, not just their own, um, and allowing a conversation and sharing to, to develop solutions together. Um, representational. So it's some of our clients sometimes say they want to involve and engage with everybody on an estate, and that's not possible for so many reasons. Not least, not everybody wants to be part of that conversation. They might not have the time, the interest, the capacity. Um, but being kind of really doing, making sure that we try and have as broad a spectrum as possible. Um, being really open and honest and transparent. Um, Sometimes clients and design teams can get really upset when what they're hearing is negative. And I think it's and, and can sometimes then stop all engagement altogether. I think as part of an engagement process, you've got to be prepared to hear criticism and understand the reason for that. Where's that coming from and how can we address that? Um, quite often a criticism we hear from communities is that they've shared their views and then they don't know what happens so for us we always try and implement feedback loops so we'll do engagements and then we'll tell the community what difference that has made to the design um, using a wide range of approaches so we i'll show you some of those in a moment and um, but making sure that it's specific and then bespoke to the project um, removing barriers so people are really intimidated by fancy drawings that they don't feel that they can understand so how can we remove some of those barriers they might also not want to go into a church for engagement purposes and that might be somewhere that we might traditionally have engagement so how can we do that um, for us being independent is critical because we can absorb some of the criticism filter that and present that back in a positive way and also identifying the wider benefit. So, um, what's the benefit to people? So, from our work as a social enterprise, one of the challenges we've always had is what's the social value of engagement? What benefit does it give to communities? So, we've asked people what they think the benefits are, and I'm not going to read them out, they're all there. Um, but this is what people have told us they believe the benefits of being involved. And you can see, you know, it really enables them to feel that they're part of a community, they're part of shaping decisions, and they feel empowered. And, and I think that's really critical when we're trying to create places that are, that are good places, that are making sure that people feel that that is their space. Um, so we can do that by involving them from the outset in a really honest and open and transparent way. Um, in terms of the value for design professionals, um, these are some of them. I think there's a lot of other ones, but just in terms of from that engagement process, what is the benefit to design? Um, I think understanding diverse views and shaping those decisions that you're making in practice is really important and, and having like, those skills to be able to do that. Uh, and that really helps to create a locally informed place specific solution, which at the end of the day is going to be a better design. Um, and we can't possibly assume to know everything. So, you know, that conversation, that listening is so, so important. And also from a really practical point of view, by having greater community buy-in because they've been involved from the, from the beginning of the project and they've been supported, then actually your planning process is more likely to go more smoothly than if you actually just tell people quite late in the day what they're getting given. But also as individuals by being involved in engagements, these are some of the things our volunteers tell us they get. So as a, as a person delivering engagements, um, they develop the skills in terms of listening and reflecting, personal satisfaction, especially alongside the education work. I think people love seeing a younger generation supporting them. Um, experiencing communication, if ideas through a lot of different audiences in any job, we quickly start using jargon. We quickly use terms and images that are not accessible. So it really challenges us to reflect on our own words and our own way of explaining, which can only then help when you speak to clients. And, and also connections and contacts from our point of view, if anyone's an ambassador with us, they're part of a, a much bigger network. But engagement isn't easy. So these are some of the barriers um, that we consistently hear um, from communities that we work with. So trust, they quite often have, people quite often have heard it all before. They've been told something's gonna happen and nothing's happened. So trust's a really big issue. Um, Quite often engagement, if we're doing an event, we might speak to someone for 40 minutes, an hour, and, and only in those last 10 minutes do we really get down to that design 
issue and the real kind of key feedback points that we can take back to a team so it's about that patience and and quite often teams design teams don't have that time to give people that they need in that conversation um, too often it's consultation and so people realize and can see that actually there's no scope for them to make any change there's no scope for them to influence decision and and they realize that means that actually we don't really want to know what they think we've just got to do this i think another barrier is around understanding local priorities and communities and i think we see this where people uh, as clients are kind of like well, we need to engage all these people but we've only got this tiny budget so you have to do it this way and especially in the current climate where it could be that people are worrying about how they're going to pay for their bills that week or provide food or the, the child health care or COVID or any of those much more complex things. When we're delivering engagement, we've got to be realistic and aware of people's wider situation. Um, access to engagement is limited. So it could be that there's a one pop up engagement event which happens in an evening when people have got childcare or in a daytime when people are at work. So it's making sure that we provide lots of different op options. And then this is just a list of some of our little tools that we use. So for us to try and address some of those barriers, we use things like our camper van, who's called Ed, um, and that removes physical thresholds and it allows people who might be walking past us to kind of just stop for a moment and have a conversation. And they would be people that wouldn't necessarily plan to come to that event, so it's incidental engagements. And they therefore wouldn't go to a town hall or a community event or debate. We do code design workshops where we get model making out and, and we try and create solutions together. Pop up shops um, where we take over the space, which could be from a day to three weeks, a month, which is the one in this image is. Um, we have a digital engagement platform, which we never used to do before COVID. Um, and we, we've, in response to COVID, we went online, but we've tried to keep the ethos of what we do. So it's about collaborative, seeing other people's ideas, having a conversation, multiple ways of sharing your views on one platform. We work a lot with young people, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and about also delivering tailored solutions where other things aren't working. So this is just few of those images and um, this is Ed, some pop-up shops and co-design workshop and now education um education's around it varies from 40 to 60 percent of our work so young people youth voice and education really kind of cut, cut across all of those the reason we do the work with young people um in itself as you all know um architecture is a brilliant sort of learning resource you develop so many skills from learning about the built environments that we don't necessarily get covered in school anymore so in terms of increasing young people's confidence and developing skills that are really really transferable whatever direction they go in the future learn about the built creating creative built environments is a brilliant way of learning we also really are passionate about young people's voices being heard and enabling them to be active citizens. So as often as possible, our work with young people is embedded in live projects for live, for real clients. Um, we're also trying to diversify who goes into the sector, so providing role models and um, making people more aware about the diversity of careers. So it's not just architecture, there's so many other routes out there that young people could go in and helping people make the right decisions for them. And really breaking down those barriers. So a lot of young people we work with would never have met a built environment professional, they've never met a planner or an architect or a contract management manager. So it's given them that opportunity to engage with practice. Okay, so our approach very much like our engagement work really is creative, it's hands-on, it's making, it's collaborative. Um, in any project, whether that be a one day workshop or a 10 month programme, we'll make sure that we look from the big picture, so from the urban design, master planning realm, right the way down to interiors where possible and everything in between. In our work with young people, we'll, like you would, kind of go from thinking about a design brief, a site analysis, the clients developing design ideas with other people, presenting the ideas, getting feedback. Um, and we might do more within that, or we might just keep it to that bare minimum, but essentially following a design process. Um, our work as a result of this delivers real social value. So the young people that we work with um, tell us that they've increased in confidence, they tell us they've developed skills, and they tell us that they've learned about careers. So for us, that's, that's obviously directly related to why we do this. 
Um, and we've had a lot of young people going into uh, university as a result of the programmes that we do, which is brilliant. And quite a few volunteer with us as well. Um, we've been doing it for, for 10 years in terms of education. So it's brilliant to see qualified architects who started off 10 years ago in the summer school. Um, the type of programmes that we run, we run things from um, school workshops for th year three upwards. We do four or five day holiday programmes, which are free to access and young people apply to take part in them. Um, we deliver engagement as part of a wider engagement commission. So any engagement project we do, we try and embed youth voice within that. Um, we support companies and organisations to reach out, so that could be developing alternative to work experience for them. And then we run the Placed Academy. So a few pictures of the type of things we do. Um, and then I'll just tell you a little bit about the Academy um, and sort of our reasons for that. So the Academy is supported by, I think this year, 30 sponsors and partners, including Anna's Practice, which is brilliant. Um, this is a programme for 14 to 18 year olds interested in built environments, but not necessarily quite sure what that means. Um, and it's a combination of in-depth programme projects. So we spend four days looking at a spatial development strategy for Liverpool City region to one day projects um, where they'll be taking on live design challenges for, for practices working in the northwest. Um, so they will work with up to 50 young people on the programme and they'll do holiday programmes, skill sessions and um, design workshops. And I think as you can see down here for us, it's around this, it's around again diversifying who's going into the built environment. Um, we've got a higher uh, number of female and male participants and a 30% from racial and ethnic minority groups. So quite high in terms of representation. And these are some of the impacts. And I think, you know, by being part of these sort of programmes, whether that be ours or finding something else local to you, you are being part of delivering this impact and you will be developing um, real skills as well as the participants. So whether that be around how you communicate to a young person, how you think creatively and resolve problems and explain ideas and help them to develop ideas, all of that that you'd be getting from supporting programmes like this will only be something you can take back into practice and support you in getting a job or support you in progression. A um, couple of examples. One is Prescott Marketplace that we did in 2017, and this is where we worked with the community to develop a brief for this space, the bottom right. Um, when we took it on, it was basically antisocial behaviour, um, a lot of drugs, bottles uh, left around there, and it didn't have any function. So we worked at primary schools, secondary schools, residents, and we did things like workshops, a treasure hunt, design slams, so really quick design challenges and a survey. Once we'd kind of worked with the community, we fed that back to the community through an exhibition to make sure we'd understood what they wanted. And that became the basis for a design brief that went out to competition and resulted in this scheme. And the scheme completely reflects what that community wanted. Um, it, as a consequence, it's well maintained. It sees positive social activity. Um, it has a cafe on there, which used to be the toilet block. And that was something the community really wanted to see. And it's a community uh, social enterprise. So they, as part of their role, they put on events and so on. So it's a really, really positive transformation of space. And a big part of that is because the community were really involved in its creation. And it was a regional finalist in the 2021 Civic Trust Awards. This is some of the activity. And then the spatial development strategy, we work with Liverpool City Region. We're about to do our third year of programming with that really complicated um, policy documents and our challenge was to reach those harder to reach underrepresented voices and, and engage them in understanding what they wanted at a policy level across Liverpool City region. So we did pop-ups in high streets across Liverpool City region and we had really interactive mechanisms to involve um, people of all different ages these boys were one of a group that came after their school every day or some of them bunked off school to come and talk to us. Um, but we had people who were homeless, we had people with addictions, mental health, physical health coming into the space alongside business owners, people from the local authority and um, charities. So it was a real kind of collective of different people. 
Um, 300, and we also involved our academy students in the programme as well. So we involved 350 people in that in that development, and it really helped to shape the priorities for the emerging SDS. And the Full City Region won the Plan Award, um, with a big part of it being around that diversity of audience. And that's it. So, as Anna says, you know, if you're interested in finding out more, you can check out our website, and or you can drop me an email on that email address there. And that's it for me. Great. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, still encouraging everyone, please drop your questions into the chat box so that we can ask them at the end and delve more uh, into the information that everyone's been um, presenting. Thank you. So, um, OK, well, without further ado, we'll we'll um, pass on to Ryan Stuckey. Um, Ryan, are you there? <laughs> I am. Hello. Hi, Ryan. So just a, br a brief instruction for Ryan. And again, if, I, if anything's wrong, please shout out. Um, but Ryan is actually a qualified architect, aren't you? And you've um, you have run your own um, practice as well, but you're concentrating now on your academic career as a, a senior lecturer at the Swansea School of Architecture. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I, I just a very, very brief uh, background to myself, if, if it helps tailor some questions. Uh, but I've been a practicing architect now for for 11 years, but uh, within a practice uh, for, for 20 odd years, uh, which came to an end at the end of uh, this act, this financial year. Uh, um, I decided to go into uh, full time academia, which I was kind of juggling both uh, at that point in time. Um, and um, and now, yes, a full time full time lecturer, which uh, which I'm thoroughly enjoying and a new set of soft skills to adapt and learn uh, and help uh, to pass on to the next generation. Um, so um, if I may, I'm going to uh, share a presentation with you. OK, uh, I'm probably going to end up duplicating some things that you've already heard uh, this afternoon, some very fascinating and interesting insights into what are soft skills. Uh, if um, if at any point you've thought, why am I sitting here listening to this? This is obvious. This is common sense. This is what we do anyway. This is what happens in life. Then I agree. Soft skills should be common sense. They should be, you know, everyday uh, um, actions. And but there's no reason why we shouldn't um, reaffirm. Uh, those soft skills and go back in and try to understand a little bit more about what we are trying to achieve and and try and develop those soft skills further. Technology advances, we need to ad advance with that. Um, uh, it was only this morning that I was going through these slides and putting them together and I realised myself, I thought, actually, you know, what, what, what are soft skills? What do I need to present? What do I need to talk about? So I spoke to a colleague of mine and he said, you're really good at all of that sort of stuff. And then he, re he rattled off what he thought soft skills were. And I thought, yeah, actually, that's the sort of stuff that I do day by day. That's the stuff that I embed into my teaching. And that's what I expect my students to come out at the other end with is having all of these skills. But they're not really at the front of your psyche as being something that you need to go away and learn because they are usually just stuff that happens. It's things that you need to exist and to be part of your uh, your your daily activities. So, you know, um, ask yourself, you know, what what are the soft skills that you've learned today? What are the soft skills that you have done without thinking about it? Um, I suppose from an anecdotal point of view, it's a little bit like um, speaking to my students about risk and asking them about, have you taken a risk today? And they'll say, well, well, no. I said, well, did you cross a road? You know, taking crossing a road is, is, is a risk, but we we learn to evaluate that risk quite quickly. Uh, and and then it becomes second nature to be able to cross the road. And I think that's the way that we should see soft skills, things that are effect effectively. Um, so I'm having a few technical difficulties moving between slides. I've got to work around. Don't worry. Um, there we go. They are effectively are essential skills. S just just keep that in mind as we're going along and, and as I'm uh, uh, communicating different things to you. OK, so. Some of the most important things uh, relating to soft skills is to do with communication. Um, I'm going to uh, speak a lot about little anecdotal snippets from my teachings and from my professional practice, and I, I hope that it'll help you kind of understand how I interpret things. Um, but 
the most basic of communication, verbal, how you speak to another human being, how you have a conversation with somebody, how you describe something. Uh, as, as, as budding architects and as architects, we have such a wonderful vocabulary to use. Uh, we, we have our own language effectively and to be able to adapt and turn our hand to that language so that we can sell and persuade others that our architecture is the right way forward is usually a really important tool, probably the most important tool, the ability to talk. But we've also learned visual skills as well uh, to be able to write the the the, the ikea uh, instruction manual for want of a better phrase you know think about perhaps your next project and think about maybe how you could put it together without saying a single word but yet allow other people to understand it don't always rely on the written word because you might be presenting to people who don't understand the language that you speak so therefore how do you get that information across to somebody uh, in a visual sense We've got to communicate online more and more. Uh, obviously, uh, since the pandemic, uh, it, it, most of you as students particularly and, and, and budding architects will have just embraced and jumped feet first into the, the online world. And teaching in this capacity uh, was something that really didn't happen three four years ago but now all of a sudden we've, we've been accelerated into it i uh, i don't i don't want to sound um like a like an anti-vaxxer or an anti-pandemic uh, uh, uh person because, because i'm not um but but it was rather interesting that teams came online about three weeks before the pandemic did um, and everything started to work really efficiently on in that respect um but thank god it did and um being able to communicate on the telephone I, I've, I've spoken to students recently and um, not only students, but in my practice previously, I would take on uh, year out placement students or I would take on uh, 15, 16 year old kids who were looking for a bit of work placement and I'd ask them to make a phone call maybe to order or book a, uh, an appointment with a CPD provider or maybe to look up and research a little bit more information about a product. And um, that's it's 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 really unfortunate um, um, that it seems to be a generational issue that picking up the telephone and speaking to someone is such a difficult task when it shouldn't be. You know, we can all walk into a bar and order a beer or a sandwich in a coffee shop. But yet when it comes to speaking to someone on the phone, um, um, there, there seems to be a, a there's sort of an interface issue. Um, and and the number of times I've seen students using their telephones for everything but being able to make a phone call, practice it, speak to people and and and, and know what it's like to be able to um, be on the receiving end of a telephone call. And and ah, that button there will help me. That's better. Right. Sorry, I found a better way to navigate these slides. And of course, emails as well. Um, being able to write and draft an email uh, in a succinct way where you get the information across is is really valuable. Um, I challenge my students in, in exam situations uh, with a with a with a sort of a, a scenario based uh, question um, ex for an exam. And um, often I'll say, write an email to your client and inevitably I end up with an essay that comes back and Clients don't want to read essays. People don't want to read essays. I don't want to read an essay when I'm marking work. I want to be able to see some bullet points or some structured uh, sort of email statements that that are easy to interpret. And and when you if you think like that and think slightly outside the box, an email becomes something different. When do we use communication skills? Well, you've all been through a tutorial with a, a member of staff with your uh, peers, with other students. It's we're going back to those skills again, those skill sets, verbal skills, presentational skills, visual skills. Crit reviews, it's kind of just sort of the next level of tutorial where you have to maybe present, get used to speaking to people uh, um, in a succinct way whereby you are able to um, speak to within time. Now, I'm going to hold my hand up. There's probably a very good chance that I'm going to either run over or not get anywhere near my 20 minute slot. So do as I say, not as I do. OK, apologize for that in advance. But but your crit reviews, they are development. It's about being able to be prepared for potential future presentations. Um, those presentations might be to a client. 
it might be to uh, other colleagues within the work placement. So you might have been given a task and then being able to present that work uh, as again in visual and verbal capacity. Um, you'll be given time restrictions. Um, why why is time so important? Well, in the simplest of terms, as architects, we we will inevitably end up presenting to council meetings, for example. Just imagine your client has given you a fifty million pound to spend, and you're in a council committee meeting, and you have five minutes to speak. Now, the entire planning application is dependent on what you say. And if you run over that five minutes and don't get the most valuable piece of information across to those councillors, they will cut you off. They'll stop you from speaking and then you no longer have that ability to defend or support the proposal that you have. Um, so you then end up possibly losing the job. Your client loses the ability to um, uh, uh, to to to, uh, to to develop and build everything slows down um, and then we, we we lose out on that what's next public consultation um yeah it, it inevitably as, as architects as well we end up in a situation whereby we have to communicate uh, with with the public um I was in a in a, in a really interesting discussion recently uh, uh, in Grange Pavilion uh, talking about public consultation and sort of debunking some of the some of the large words that architects use uh, um, and not only architects but but the construction industry and and the public generally don't understand what we're talking about and saying so you have to have the ability to speak their language um, the biggest project I, I worked on in this capacity was in Merthyr Town Football Club where we had to sort of appease the neighbours that putting a new uh, bar, restaurant and, and nightclub, for, for, for example, uh, it, it wasn't going to affect their, their, their way of life. Um, you know, I went along to that meeting expecting them to ask me questions about the architecture. And believe it or not, I, uh, some of the questioning was more about whether there would be empty pint glasses left in their front lawns and things like that. So it's all about, you know, basic skills and, and just, just really understanding what people need and want. So um, moving on to the next uh, block of information, um, we are looking at teamwork. Um, we... Um, uh, Anna alluded earlier on to the fact that in architectural school we we do tend to uh, be very focused on individual projects, but we do break out occasionally in, into teams. And not only that, but you kind of do it by proxy as well. Um, you are able to um, do, sort of work with others, whether it be with a purpose for a purposeful goal or or just to sort of bounce ideas off each other. But it's really important. Um, that, you know, in teamwork, that you have the ability to lead, but most, it's even more important to be led by somebody. So it, it, it can be easier, actually, to create a team and lead that team than it can be to actually sit and listen and have the ability to inform and support a team, um, but without actually taking overall control. Uh, and, and I suppose the further down the path of your career as you go, the more you'll realise that and the more the more that working with a team is probably about a cohesion and a general framework of understanding than than having a hierarchy, a pyramidal hierarchy. Um, yeah, within teamwork, again, just be flexible. Make sure that uh, that you, you listen to other people's comments and embrace what they have to say. Be forthright and get your point across, because very often um, that that might be the right point, but be um uh what's the word um uh, be understanding that it might not be and, and that somebody else might have a better a better point to, to, to put across or, or a better option in place um and be humble about that and obviously be supportive so you know if it doesn't go your way run with whatever the team uh, it, it has sort of agreed on and obviously you know help with motivation trying to um, lift people's spirits, get people in the mood to actually work as a team. Um, that, that can be a challenge in itself. Um, and I'll come back on to some of that later on under a different heading. So this next one is about um, emotional intelligence. It's a little bit more about uh, uh, having sort of some, some, some moral strength uh, to support a team or to support others um, and to be helpful within, um, you know, a creative environment. 
It's about being able to manage a situation. And by that, I mean, you know, there could be an argument. You've got a dispute to deal with. Um, how do you how do you have the capacity to liaise between two parties? Uh, uh, very often it could be that, you know, you've you've got a, a team member that isn't um, necessarily working well with a client. How do you how do you deal with that situation? Or from a student capacity, you're working in a team. You've just been told that you've got a, a three week project to do a town study and there's a member of the team who just doesn't turn up. How do you manage that? How do you approach that situation? And I suppose it's just coming back to those common sense issues and being professional about it. Now then, um, for some of you, and I'm hoping that quite a large chunk of you as, as, as students of architecture and, and future architects will understand a little bit about dispute resolution. Certainly part two students will have had prior knowledge. Uh, I know my first year, first part students have got uh, prior knowledge of dispute resolution. We go through it as, as a classroom exercise um, and, and we, we have a, um, a discussion about the various options, whether it be mediation or arbitration um, or, or litigation. And you might say, well, well, you know, what has this got to do with soft skills? And I suppose the big question is, which one of those do you use when there's a dispute? That dispute might between, be between your client and, and the contractor. It might be between you and a client or you and a member of the public. Or, you know, what processes do you use for mediation, arbitration or litigation? Well, I suppose where the soft skills come in is this bit. This is my favourite bit. You go for a coffee. That's the first port of call is always to sit down and have a chat before you get legal teams involved. Having a debate with somebody and just saying, look, let's have a cup of coffee, let's see where it went wrong, and 99% of the time you'll go in the right direction and you'll all come out of it. Eh, not always happy, but at least there'll be some kind of beneficial resolution where it doesn't cost the earth. So just, just remember that you might be taught the legal process, but there might always be a, a much simpler way of solving a problem. Okay. So um, we have, and I haven't got much time left, so I'm going to rattle through these quite quickly. We've got embedded knowledge as well, something else to, to, to consider. Um, things that you, again, you do without really thinking about it, coming back onto those emails. You know, if you're asked to write a letter, write a letter, a formal one. Make sure it's set out and structured the way that letters should be. And if you don't know those skills, go and learn them. Find out about letter writing. Don't just assume you know how to write that letter. Um, and also structure it in a way that it makes it easy for people to read. You know, for the same thing, a report has a format that needs to be followed, a statement or a form. It all gets followed in, in, in the correct order. But know your audience, know who's going to be reading it. Um, if, if, if you're um, writing a fee quotation, for example, you might follow the RIBA schedule of works, but your client is highly unlikely to understand what any of that means. So make it simple for them. Bullet point things. I always quite I, I like to bullet point stuff just to make it easy. And if any of my students are out there, by the way, I find it easier to mark bullet points than essays. It's so much easier to work out where the where, where the positives are. So so keep it easy for me as well. Embedded knowledge. You've got the design team. Know what the design team can do for you. Go and research them. Find out. You know, the, the, I've mentioned local knowledge there, you know, so so if you need an ecologist to work on a scheme with you, understand what the environment is in which the ecologist has to write a report on. Um, have a have a prior knowledge of, of your site. Um, it's it you know, I've mentioned continual learning there. It's uh, it's it's about sort of progressing and making sure that you, you know, you, you, you keep up on your knowledge, which is effectively CPD and self-appraisal, making sure that you backtrack, listen to what you've done before, learn from that and move forward. And most importantly, and uh, again, this is something that um, I have issues with as a, as a lecturer, is getting people to understand how to save files making sure that they're not enormous file sizes that can't be sent via email, making sure that they're numbered correctly, making sure that files are have your name on them or the, the type of project on them or some kind of ordered uh, numerical system that can be searched and researched and backtracked at a, at a later date. 
basic computer skills. We all know how to use Revit and we all know how to use AutoCAD or possibly even Photoshop, all the big programs. But it seems that all the tech uh, students that I have, they all then struggle to be able to compress a file or to be able to produce a simple PDF or JPEG. So just make sure that you learn the basic skills before you move forward. Um, and, you know, being professional and be useful is just coming back to that common sense stuff. And I'm going to just sort of um, wrap it, this up quite quickly. Um, CVs and, 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 and interviews. It's something that's going to be quite important for you all um, as you progress through your uh, your academic career, so um, and through through architecture, um, is is what I call space fillers. Everybody can write a CV and tell tell me what they've done in college and what their portfolio is, but I want you to tell me who you are as a person. If I was ever reading your CV, you know, tell tell me you were a student ambassador. If that was the role that you undertook, tell me that you you were a junior rugby coach. Uh, or a musician or a, a charitable volunteer or, or an events organizer um, or you travel. All of these things have an ability to be able to tell the, 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 the reader of your CV or possibly in an interview situation what sets you apart. You know, most of these things tell me that you've got the ability to um, organize, to organize others, to work in a team. You don't need to be able to say in a CV, oh, I'm a hardworking, uh, um, uh, learned academic, or I'm, you know, don't use those types of, of language. Tell them those things through a story and say, you know, I'm a junior rugby coach. Straight away, that suggests responsibility, an ability at something, um, an understanding and knowledge of another field other than the one that you're going into. These things tell the story correctly without you having to sort of rely on sort of simplistic language. And I'm going to sort of leave this one quite simple. Um, the RABA and the ARB have what we call a code of ethics. And again, coming back to soft skills, if you if you read them correctly and understand them, then they are quite simply common sense. That's all it is, okay? And uh, I'm gonna leave you with that and thank you. And I'm gonna hand you back over to Anna. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was really interesting. And exactly what you're saying, that soft skills are largely common sense um, and something that you sort of, it's linked to me. Um, but I think sometimes it's worth sort of picking them out so that you're aware of what's going on and sort of how you can control certain situations. Um, OK, so we'll move on to the questions. Um, if you do, I've said it before, put it in the chat. If you do have any questions, thank you, Tim. I've just seen these put a question. I was going to just rewind slightly onto your, um, um, oh, if um, Juliet and Joe could turn on their cameras as well, that would be great. Um, I was going to throw over your CV um, question round to Juliet and um, see if you had any tips uh, for writing the narrative for, for your actual CV. It would be really helpful to everyone. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So I love um, your ex uh, example, Ryan, about the um, being a rugby junior rugby coach, and I think it's about taking that that um, that fact about being a junior rugby coach and turning it into kind of a, a sort of again a why, how, what. So junior rugby coach, um, you know, passion for rugby. Um, love the the challenge of it, or you know, love what it um, the uh, what it uh, what it uh, what it needs to be in that position, and then say kind of how you've how you help people, the the skills of coaching, and then the impact of it. I mean, that can turn into a quite the way I've said it, quite a long story. But I think if you just take why, how, what, and finishing on sort of the impact of it and how it gives you the skills that you take into a job so again you need to be thinking about who's going to read who's reading your cv and what they want to get out of it so it's about you know junior rugby coach gives you that that skill of empathy because you're having to sort of understand the people uh, motivate you know motivating people and uh you know the rigor of it and i think that's what you're uh then emphasizing Thanks, Julia. Um, I've just noticed another question that's come in for you. Um, I'm going to read it out. Uh, so with uh, LinkedIn dominated with companies using a language of self glorification to primarily advertise to potential clients, how would you use social media without going down a similar path to engage clients? 
I think it's about being helpful. I think it's about, you know, whatever you're posting, just think about, about, you know, what can I give people? How can I be generous with my knowledge? How can I help them? Um, and I think, you know, that's true on social media. And I think a lot of, you know, good LinkedIn engagement is through being helpful, is through sharing skills. And one thing which is kind of linked to social media is blog posts. Um, you know, um, people find it really difficult to count to sustain a blog. But one good way to think of it is it's a resource section. So instead of a blog post about, you know, we're delighted to have got planning permission for the, uh, which isn't that interesting, kind of isn't going to be interested in a interesting in a year's time because things will have moved on. Write a blog post about something you know your clients are always asking you and um you know that's true for students as well something some skill that they think they've learned which they can be helpful about so a blog post can be a re a blog section on a website can be a resource section with lots of interesting helpful things so i think that's the that's the key word being helpful thank you yeah i think that's so true um another question which i might um give to ryan first but maybe joe could chip in um in what ways can people with disabilities, neurodivergences or other restrictions um, be supported with their soft skills? Um, would you like me to, to sort of open up with that? Yeah, Ryan, if you don't mind, yeah. I guess from a, um, an, an academic sort of standpoint first, it would be great from the unisex it, side. Yeah, it's, it, I, suppose, I suppose everybody has a, a difference. We're all different from each other. There's uh, s s some people have difficulties more than others uh, to deal with, um, and those all have to be assessed at, at, at different levels and and by different people and with different levels of support. I suppose just being open and honest and asking people for advice and guidance is the first thing. Um, you know, in my situation, if a student came to me and said, look, you know, I've got these difficulties, um, I'm, I'm, you know, without elaborating on what they might be, um, I, I, I would probably sort of sit down and try and work out what they felt would be a way forward or what a solution would be. But from an academic point of view, we do have a, a whole team of people um, uh, we, you know, in our university, we would class them as student services, um, and, and they would be sort of skilled and trained at offering support and guidance and help. And at that, you know, after I've given it some consideration, I would then be able to direct them, if not give them the answer, direct them to the people that can. But I think the most important thing is to sort of come out and express exactly what you feel is a is a concern, um, and then that that can be debated and discussed. And that, ironically, having the ability to approach somebody and say, look, you know, I can't really do it this way because um, is a soft skill in itself, that ability to communicate. Um, that's great. So Joe, jo, from a kind of engagement point of view, is there any way that you can you tailor your approach? Oh, I think you're on mute, sorry. So, I was thinking about our shafts all that time. Um, in terms of how um, perhaps it, it would be really good for us to have more neurodiverse and people with disabilities within our volunteer network. I think we have neurodiverse participants, but not necessarily within our volunteers. And I, I think that'd be fab fantastic for us to have a volunteer level. So those those people who are neurodiverse or who have disabilities working along within that framework in a way that they're happy and comfortable with to support other young people who can then see them as role models. I think that would be a really, really invaluable thing. Um, and in our engagement, we're, we're, con we're conscious that the people with disabilities quite often are underrepresented in engagements, except through very specific organisations that are there to represent, um, I don't know, like, uh, people with different needs within their very specific, um, which we wouldn't do for any other group. So in no other group would we go, one organisation represents the views of all. And therefore, again, it would be great to have more volunteers, more ambassadors who could be part of our network and therefore help us reach out to other people with disabilities, other people who are neurodiverse and have those conversations. I think that would be a great thing. And through doing that, we'd also be helping those people develop their soft skills that they can take back to practice as well. Um, I think from a, an office point of view as well, um, hopefully 
any office would be supportive and understanding and 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 help in that way. But what I'm seeing more and more of, which is I think is quite interesting, is say sign offs on the bottom of emails. People are writing, you know, I'm not this is not my forte. So if you need me, please don't phone me because I prefer it if you contact me this way. Or, you know, I'm dyslexic, so apologies if my writing um it doesn't make sense. If it doesn't, please call me. Um, and you know, these are people who are very well respected and high up in in their fields who are just making it clear to people they're communicating with that they find certain things more difficult or different from other people. And I think it's great that they have the confidence to be able to say that and ultimately it will help people responding to them as well. So that's just becoming more and more common and hopefully it continues to do so. If, if I if I may just add a little, um, whilst, whilst there are always concerns and issues where people have um, uh, challenges with various levels of communication for want of a better phrase. Um, I think the, the problem that we find in our academia is um, sort of a, um, an instant jump to right I can't do it therefore I won't do it and 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 I think the whole point of going through our academic processes is that we we, we nurture people into things like presenting and skills like that. Okay there are always going to be cases when it can't be done but take the opportunity to to learn how to present to communicate to uh, go through all of those various challenges whilst you're in college because it does build up a little bit of confidence it builds up a little bit of a um, a technique being being able to, you know doing what we are doing now on the screen we don't do it because we we we're born good at it it's because we we're all gone through a process where we've done it several possibly several hundred times and then we build up techniques on how to do that and that's effectively what the academic process is for so that you you know so you learn those soft skills and they become embedded knowledge and I, can I just add as well, I think within any company, people are getting much clearer about what their strengths, weaknesses, things they like, things they don't like, their working conditions. I think COVID's been really radical in terms of that. So within my team, um, three people are part time. Everyone has different preferences about when they work, how they work, how they like to communicate within the team. And I do think that's becoming much more normal for people to be really open, whether it be in neurodiverse or not. I think we all have different preferences and I, and I think it's being confident and, and, and communicating that and just being really trying to express what those challenges are. And But, you know, as Ryan says, giving things a try as well. Um, I think that's definitely what we say to young people in our programs you know give it a try and don't don't worry everyone in this in the space is probably feeling similar to you um I think we look out and we think everyone's doing amazing and actually quite often people find things terrifying just in the same way that's absolutely true for example I find speaking publicly terrifying and I'm doing it <laughs> so you know <laughs> you really well Anna just an example that wasn't to get any compliments. Um, so I'm just uh, conscious of time. We are at two o'clock now and I'm sure everyone either wants to go and eat lunch or continue with their work. So um, I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you to Ryan and Joe and Juliet for your really inspirational presentations. Really interesting. And I hope everyone listening has um, sort of understood more about soft skills and hopefully got some hints and tips on how they can use them to help with their career. So. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.